this is a, a perfect example how the lack of coordination and many decades of talking results in coordination. Because we decided we will not talk about what we will speak about, so every one of us is not influenced by the other, but of course we are influenced by the other anyway. And therefore the session that was completely unprepared to be coordinated actually touches on the very same themes, although I will not talk about fiscal policy, I will talk about the deficit. And I will talk about something that has to do with whether dynamics matters and how this matters for thinking about Trump, but not from this point of view. So what is the task that I've set to myself? Uh, it has to do with my thinking about Trump, basically. And what this has to do with is Trump is well known to have been very, had a great deal of disdain about the experts. And I decided to ask myself a question in connection with this conference that Ned organized and the methodology panel that I was participating in, I decided to ask myself two questions. The first one is, how does the, the economics profession respond to Trump's irrationality? And the second issue, how we can rationally assess consequences of his policies? It's a very difficult topic because I was very worried about coming across as saying that uh, there's something about the economists that Trump shares, because I don't believe that, although there is perhaps something. <laughs> and uh, so let me start with these two issues, and then I'll tell you about something practical at the end that I found sort of intriguing at least. So the talk is in three parts, like a little play, everyone five minutes. So the first one is Trump speaking and his officials. The second part is economy speaking, and the third part is my humble self speaking. <laughs> so let's start with Trump. During his, one of his campaign rallies on April, I'm going to read because I want to make sure that I don't move extemporaneously given the time. There's a lot to talk about. We can talk about it for a day. During one of his campaign rallies on April 4th, 2016, Trump revealed his disdain for those on whom our society relies to gather and interpret the facts that serve as crucial input to democratic discourse and policy making. He declared that, I can't do his accent, I wish I could. You know, I've always wanted to say this. I've never said this before with all the talking that we all do. All of these experts, oh, you need, oh we need an expert. The experts are terrible. In the period since the election, it has become a cliche that as president, Trump is pursuing with astonishing zeal an effort to reshape our public discourse and policy making to confirm to his belief that expertise based on reason and interpretation of facts is fake news. What is important for my talk is that he's he declares to his infatuated supporters to replace rational thinking with his alternative facts and his true interpretations of them. So being a good monarch, his administration obliges and follows the monarch's line. So administration's officials have followed Trump in pronouncing on the true consequences, quote unquote, of the policies that they propose. Nowhere has this been more evident than in the Secretary, Treasure, uh, Secretary Mnuchin's often quoted assertions as reported by the New York Times on November 30, 2017, I quote, the one and a half trillion dollars tax overhaul will pay for itself through a surge of economic growth and that 100 people in Treasury are working around the clock on running scenarios for us. In the event, the Treasury produced no analysis of the impact of tax overhaul on the fiscal deficit. Mnuchin's often repeated pronouncements that the taxpayer will pay for itself have turned out to be another attempt to exploit the well-worn propaganda practice that repeating an unfounded assertion will turn into truth. By the way, this is my comment on the graphs that Charles Colomero 
presented about the business community optimism being picked up after Trump's election. Economies both of those supporting and opposing the administration's plan have injected some, now the second act, have injected some rationality into the tax debate. They've done so by producing precise projections of the efforts of the bill on economic growth and discussing those projections in ways accessible to the broader public in a series of commentaries prepared for Project Syndicate. This debate exemplifies, and this is where we parallel with NET almost completely because it so happens that it's also about growth, the current approach to economic analysis of the consequences of policy initiatives such as the tax bill. To carry out such analysis, economists typically rely on standard macroeconomic models, again, unfortunately, University of Pennsylvania, but that is because Trump went there, such as the stochastic Penn Wharton overlapping generations model. Like any economic model, this model formalizes an economist's understanding of the growth process. Because the economist's understanding of this process summarizes the accumulative wealth of empirical evidence and theoretical insight, standard macroeconomic models are indeed based on what we usually refer to as rational considerations. They're based on reason, they're based on facts. But there's a catch. The catch is, there's Ned and I pointed out in our recent op-ed, like other standard macroeconomic models, the growth models rest on the core premise that the consequences of the tax changes can be characterized precisely as a random deviation around the deterministic growth path over a period as long as 10 years. But as Karl Popper pointed out a long time ago, what the standard models cannot account for is, as he put it, the future is open, it is objectively open. And yet standard macroeconomic models assume that the future is objectively closed. They dispense with what Frank Knight referred to almost a century ago as, I quote, true uncertainty. This uncertainty arises from unforeseeable change in good part, in this case, coming from the path that dynamism and creativity will take to connect to Ned's talk, which might define a change that cannot be characterized in advance with probabilistic rules. So one cannot in advance say what, whether somebody will invent yet another iPad and put a probability on it. One cannot yet say whether somebody will invent another way to organize a factory floor and put a probability on it. The consequences of historical events, such as the one and a half trillion tax cut, are clearly unforeseeable in night sense. At the time the bill was enacted, there was simply no past data to specify a stochastic model that would predict ex ante the timing and impact of the tax changes on the economy's growth path. Neither treasury economists nor anyone else could have predicted precisely the future consequences of the tax bill. Yet, as I said, both the proponents and opponents of the bill were doing exactly that and, of course, coming up with the exactly opposite conclusions. We have no time to go into how that how, how you can get the opposite conclusion. But there's one thing they did agree on, that nothing unforeseeable will ever happen, both the proponents and the opponents. So now, what are the implications of this for understanding where we are and then taking us just a step further? I just want to make one point, which is in the next slide, which I go over quickly. Once an economist assumes that he can represent the growth process precisely, he can, of course, compute the consequences of the tax bill precisely. Importantly, such predictions are rational in a much stronger sense than being based on reasoning and understanding. In my recent work with my Danish colleagues, I showed that whenever an economist formulates a model that assumes away 90 and true uncertainty, <coughs> and this is the key, he has no option but to assert that his no understanding of the process, his own rationality, represents precisely how every rational individual understands and forecasts outcomes. In the context of the analysis of the consequences of tax overhaul, this assertion takes a striking form. By assuming a way unforeseeable change, 
The standard growth models hypothesize that future political developments will not lead to a reversal of the tax law's major provisions. Remarkably, these models also assume that the economy's participants are rational in how they make consumption, investment, and other decisions, which presumably gives these models legitimacy, they will just like economists assume that tax changes will remain virtually intact as the law of the land into foreseeable future. However, once we introduce unforeseeable change, it's not something we're going to do here, we can actually build formal models that recognize the rational individual's understanding of the economy is different from economists' understanding. This would enable economic analysis to recognize that the future is objectively open and the rational individuals will devise the best way to understand it and to deal with it through creativity, through their dynamic activities, through the rest of it. So now you think I've gone so far away from where we are, then I need to come back now. So now the last, the attempt to come back. So that's the last act. Does this methodological discussion make any difference for how we can analyze the economic consequences of Mr. Trump? I'll take something very prosaic, although it has other broad implications for macro policy and many other things, regulation. I want to sketch how recognizing that economies face night and uncertainty and that market participants have autonomous understanding of the future. It's amazing that you use that term, Ned. Autonomous understanding of the future. If they have agency, now I have to give it to Richard. <laughs> Three of us. Right. Uh, uh, that if they have autonomous understanding of the future political, opens a new way, a new path to interpreting the consequences of Trump for future stock price movement, something as prosaic as this. And I was actually quite surprised when I looked at these numbers. I will hasten to add that this is extremely preliminary. This can all be done formally, but of course I will not do that here. So let's go to nuts and bolts and get that table with the stock prices. Right. So a commonly used metric to assess whether equity prices are too high or that the market is just close to reversal relies on the price-earning ratio. So this table shows two different price-earning ratios. In one of the columns, the 10-year price-earning ratio is the stock price divided by the 10-year average of earnings, of corporate earnings. In real terms, the data come from Bob, Bob Schiller's uh, really authoritative data set. And there's a 12-month PE. The difference between these numbers is large, and I need to say a word about where the difference comes from. If you take a 10-year PE ratio, then you basically are looking, in rough sense, at the distribution of income over the last 10 years. So if you have a growing inequality, then the denominator here will be much lower. And therefore, the current price divided by price earning ratio will be much higher. If you look at the 12-month P ratio, then as long as prices move sort of with earnings, you're going to get different numbers. So what do we see here? That parallels some of the things that Angus Dino was getting at actually at lunch. A 10-year P.E. ratio has dramatically increased since the beginning of the second term of the Obama presidency. What does that mean? That means that the inequality in the United States has not started with Trump, starting in 2010. There's been a corporate earnings of nearly 70% during the 2010-2015 period of Obama's presidency. And the sharp increase, of course, resumed with Trump, with the earnings raising nearly 20% over the 18-month periods from November 18 to 16 to March 18. At the same time, that's important, interest rates rose during Obama's second term. The 12-month ratio shows the same tendency, though the increase is much more moderate. So what do these points suggest? They suggest, you see, if, roughly speaking, if mo earnings move up with prices or prices move with earnings, that there's no autonomous effect. There is no expectational effect because the rest is sort of, roughly speaking, an expectational effect. So if the price earning ratio moves up, that means that there's an additional element to earnings 
that moves prices up, and that's particularly true if the interest rates actually are increasing, which they are from about 2012. So then there's no doubt almost that it's an expectational effect. So then the next question is, where does this expectational effect come from? In a standard economic model, it should come from just earnings, but you already see it's not going to do. So it has to come from somewhere else. But where is that somewhere else? Behavioral economists would say psychology, and I would look to politics. So that's what I want to do next. Okay? So the question I want to ask in my last two slides is, does this admittedly cursory look at the evidence, and I stress it's admittedly cursory, indicate that we are in the middle of a Trump boom, in the sense that the election of Trump provided a strong positive boost to the, market, boost to the market's optimism? The short answer to that is that it's too early to say, because so far Trump has not matched anywhere near the redistributive tendencies of the Obama years. He's nowhere near. If he continues, he might actually do that. So what, do we, what does it say about the future movements? Well, the future movements are really interesting. Let's keep the table on the time. The 10-year P ratio is very high. 32, note that we just had an anniversary of the Lehman, there was 20 just before the onset of the financial crisis. 32 is a big number. That's a big number. The 12 pound ratio stands only at around 25. Given the expected interest in interest rates, I from suggest two contingent predictions in a sense of Karl Popper. That's for another time. So one contingent prediction is this. The economy will return to the earlier, less unequal distribution of income, likely triggering the market's decline unless interest rates decline, which is unlikely. Regressive policies and stagnation in wage growth will continue thereby sustaining the bull market even in the face of higher interest rates. What is interesting about it is that the moment the market participants seem to forecast the continuation of the regressive tendencies that began in the Obama era, even if Democrats gain the upper hand electorally. The market doesn't seem to be much worried about the Democrats winning. So now we go to the last slide. So where does this leave us? So here's where I just want to reflect a little more broadly for a minute. The contingency of these predictions for my discussion about the debate regarding the impact of tax changes, it's clear. I mean, it connects clearly with what Ned said. You can't talk about growth in a model in which the economist tells you where the growth path is going to be as a random abbreviation around the deterministic path. It omits everything that was on those graphs uh, that Ned was looking at just about everything that growth may, so then if that model tells you whether it's fiscal or monetary policy, it may indeed be fiscal or monetary policy, but you have absolutely no basis to even state that, let alone whether it is. So that's the first point, so that's how it connects. The second thing actually connects with the next session in a very clear way. They, I just argue against exact predictions, but not by putting these two sessions together and by the surreptitious event that I didn't have the slides I speak next actually connected what we do with the next session. The next session is about structural change. And to predict the future exactly, one would have to talk about the change in Trump's policies in probabilistic terms. And so while I'm sure the next session will agree that there's structural change, I'm sure everyone would agree that this cannot be put in probabilistic terms because we have no prior data. That's one of the things that is obvious about Trump. We have no prior data for the world in which we have entered. It illustrates the peril of relying on models that assume that we can deliver precise predictions regarding the consequences of the policies, such as the one and a half trillion tax overhaul, whether we like the bill because we're Democrats or whether we be, because we're Republicans or we don't like the bill because we're Democrats. So what is the consequence of this precision for the public interest and for the public debate, which is what I want to end with. And that's basically why I prepared this talk. The precision promised by such predictions will inevitably be followed by their eventual inaccuracy. 
owing precisely to dynamism, unforeseeable change, variety of things. And what does it contribute to? It contributes to the public's impression that economists, who after all, I want to emphasize this, have considerable knowledge and expertise about the way the economy works, that their knowledge is of limited use in informing public debate. It almost accidentally, although I hate to say this, may in the, in the eyes of an educated public, it may, they may conclude that maybe Mnuchin, who didn't want to compute this because he's a complete ignorant, maybe that wasn't so crazy that he didn't want to compute it. This is exactly what the demagogues exploit. They exploit such demonstrably false impression to disguise their ignorance as truth. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ramesh.